All right, well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Director Ray here uh, for a visit here in Dallas. Um, obviously, it's very important for him to meet with all of our uh, law enforcement at the federal, state, and local level, uh, and I know he's going to uh, have some more uh, private conversations with them soon after. But uh, with that said, I know he did have uh, a statement and was going to take a couple of questions from our local media. So we will, I will turn it over to uh, Director Ray. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, in just a few minutes, I'm looking forward to the chance to speak with many of our key local, state, and federal law enforcement partners from this area to talk with them about the great work we're all doing together here in North Texas. Uh, one of the things I plan to raise with them, um, and if I don't, I'm sure they'll raise it with me, uh, is the success of the Dallas Police Department Violent Crime Reduction Plan. And because of the great work these partnerships represent, we've seen a reduction in overall violent crime in this area. But at the same time, we're noticing a troubling increase in juvenile offenders. Uh, and that increase matches trends that we're seeing on a national level. And I'm seeing that both in the crime statistics the FBI collects and hearing it in the conversations I have with police chiefs and sheriffs really all across the country just about every week. Whether it's carjackings, armed robberies, or even worse violence, Juveniles committing serious violent crimes are a challenge that everybody in law enforcement faces these days. And it takes the combined effort of federal and local law enforcement, school resource officers, U.S. attorney's offices, and state prosecutors to bring these cases to a successful conclusion. But we're not just seeing that trend in gang and gun violence. Hardly a week goes by that I'm not briefed on a juvenile here in the United States motivated to commit extremist violence, including here in North Texas. In fact, each of the past three years, the Dallas area has seen an increase in cases involving juveniles inspired by foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS. And again, Thanks to the partnerships represented here, we've disrupted juveniles who were actively planning attacks. That's one of the reasons our Dallas division is growing its threat assessment and threat management program to be even better at serving, coordinating, communicating with our law enforcement and community partners in this area, like local school districts, mental health professionals, strong partnerships across all these things are key to the FBI's mission to keep our communities safe because at the end of the day, we can accomplish so much more when we work together. And you can see that in the serious dent that we've put collectively in the overall violent crime here. For example, this past July, the FBI Dallas Safe Streets Task Force with task force officers from the Dallas and Irving Police Departments, the Dallas County Sheriff's Department, and the Texas Department of Criminal Justice led a coordinated takedown of almost 50 gang members following a two-year investigation. Just last month, the Child Exploitation Task Force here, working with the Plano Police Department and an FBI hostage rescue team, led an operation against a sex trafficking ring one that brutally controlled women with tasers and shock collars, breaking bones and even waterboarding them, all while also threatening the safety of their families. As of now, five subjects have been located and arrested. These are the kind of people that we're taking off the streets together, working together. Keeping our communities safe is the most fundamental duty in all of law enforcement, and that is something the FBI cannot do alone, which is why I'm so grateful for the partnerships that you see here in this room and for this group's continued dedication to find even more ways we can support each other and the public we serve. Working in law enforcement is certainly not easy these days, so we appreciate, I appreciate, the sacrifices the partners here with me today make and have made 
and continue to make to protect their fellow Americans just as important. We appreciate the sacrifices that all the men and women who work for them have made and continue to make serving this community. So we're proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with all of our law enforcement partners here in Texas. And on behalf of the FBI, I want to say once more to all of them, thank you for your service, your support, your partnership, uh, and now I'd be happy to take a few questions. Yes, thank you for being here with us today. Um, so part of the problem with juvenile crime here at the state level is a revolving door with violent offenders. They go in, they come out, they're right back out on the street. What more can be done at the federal level to deal with the prosecution and actually putting very violent offenders, juvenile offenders, behind bars for good? Well, you put your, your finger on a, a very important point um, that's not unique uh, to North Texas. Um, which is that generally the laws, including federal laws, uh, are not particularly well suited for dealing with uh, juvenile violence and juvenile crime. Um, and so it's one of the reasons we've had to be even more resourceful working together with the U.S. Attorney's Office, with state and local prosecutors who often may have more readily available uh, tools, but also when I mentioned this threat assessment, threat management program, uh, the, the whole goal of that is to bring together not just different jurisdictions of prosecutors and law enforcement, but also school resource officers, mental health professionals, uh, other sorts of uh, disciplines to try to put the pieces together to figure out is there some other way to disrupt the threat. Uh, you know, maybe there's some kind of treatment the person needs to be get sent off for. Maybe there's, uh, you know, a way to uh, deprive them of access to weapons. I mean, there's a bunch of things that can be done, uh, but it's a, it definitely a team effort, and it's a complicated challenge. Uh, having said all that, as big a believer as I am in all those services and community outreach and everything else, repeat violent offenders need to be held accountable, even if they're juveniles. Uh, and so that means all of us working with our prosecutorial counterparts to try to figure out how we can do that and send the message that we're not going to let violent crime sail on by, even if it's committed by a juvenile. I think that's really important for a message of deterrence and for the, the, you know, the safety of the community. Help me Phyllis. Carol D. Morning, Director. Uh, we are heading into a contentious voting uh, uh, election cycle, and uh, uh, we've been hearing a lot about how uh, various agencies, local, state, and federal, have been hardening the systems against any attempts by outsiders to influence the outcome of an election. But I haven't heard a whole lot mentioned about voter safety. Uh, what are you, as director of the largest law enforcement apparatus in the country, able to tell voters about their safety standing in lines when it comes time to cast ballots? Are there, in fact, uh, people out there that you are picking up signals that are uh, intending to disrupt voting? So it, it, you're asking specifically about sort of physical uh, threats, right? Because uh, obviously we're also... Uh, investigating and constantly on the lookout for cyber threats to election infrastructure as well. So on the physical safety part, uh, needless to say, um, we, you know, threats of violence or intimidation uh, directed at any citizen who are uh, trying to simply exercise their right to vote is uh, something we take extremely seriously. When it comes to physical security uh, around polling places, that's uh, first and foremost uh, the jurisdiction and responsibility of our state and local partners. But we that's part of why partnership is so key, because we work closely with them in terms of sharing intelligence, uh, sometimes we have predicated investigations, things like that. So we're laser focused on this kind of issue. I can tell you we're not currently tracking any specific plot along those lines, but uh, that should not be confused uh, as a lack of focus on this issue. We are intensely focused on 
any clues or signs that we see uh, of something along these lines and are committed to taking it seriously and working with our, our partners here uh, to make sure that we can protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Thank you for being here this morning. So we're about to approach a one-year mark where North Texas saw a huge outbreak when it comes to overdoses with fentanyl. So I want to know, not only at a local level, what resources are being poured into, but also overseas, as the, it was said that what we were seeing here was greatly due in part to the cartels. So certainly what we're seeing here in North Texas is, I think, representative of what we, the FBI, are seeing nationally, um, which is that Mexican transnational criminal groups, the cartels, continue to be the primary source uh, of fentanyl uh, that's the scourge of this country, and it's typically produced with Chinese-sourced precursors, uh, and it affects not just Texas and North Texas, but really all over uh, the United States. Um, and I have, I think in the past, and I continue to view it as a, a threat of really epidemic proportions. Uh, so what are we doing about it? Well, the first thing we're doing about it is partnering with folks like all the great leaders you see here in this room. Um, but just to break that down a little bit more specifically, both here in Dallas and more nationally, uh, we're trying to focus on what can we bring to the table to put together what they can bring to the table. So that's everything from using our Safe Streets task forces, which have representatives of a lot of the departments you see in here on them, uh, focusing on the gangs uh, distributing a lot of this stuff. We're focused through our transnational organized crime task forces, which again have representatives of, of a lot of the departments and agencies you see here focusing on uh, the source of the supply, which, as you say, is, you know, typically the cartels. I think the FBI has something like 380 thereabouts investigations just into cartel leadership. Um, and so we're hitting distribution, supply. We also have things uh, like something we call J-Code, which is uh, uh, the FBI's, again, interagency partnered with other agencies effort to focus on the dark net, the trafficking of, of opioids, especially fentanyl, on the dark net, dismantling dark net marketplaces, uh, which is a huge problem. Um, we have a prescription drug effort, which is focused on you know, pill mills and things like that, which are its own uh, part of the problem. Uh, we're working with foreign partners, obviously in places like Mexico, continuing to work with our law enforcement partners there wherever we can, our partners in Canada, for example. Um, and then we're doing things, uh, for example, on the uh, demand side, on the awareness side. We worked very closely with DEA uh, a while back on a, a, a film called Chasing the Dragon, which we made available in schools, and we've got similar outreach and awareness efforts that are focused on middle schools and high schools, colleges, places like that, to do our part to kind of, um, like I said, raise, raise awareness. So there's a bunch of different pieces to it, uh, but this problem is bigger than any one law enforcement agency. Frankly, it's, it's bigger than law enforcement. It requires, you know, uh, health professionals uh, and all sorts of other uh, parts of the, of, the, of the society's response to this issue. But uh, it is a scourge, and we're committed to doing our part. It's very rare these days that I would go a month without hearing about some FBI field office uh, that isn't seizing in one seizure enough fentanyl to wipe out an entire state. One office, one seizure, and that's happening all year long. Um, so this is a, a, a threat of sort of massive proportions. Um, in reference to the issue that you brought up uh, in terms of juvenile crime, I was curious uh, if you could elaborate on what you think the cause is of juvenile crime increasing, even in areas where overall crime is decreasing. I did also want to ask you, though, about any concerns you might have about anti-Semitism or uh, an increase in hate crimes as well, if you could address those issues. Uh, okay, so I'll take uh, two questions. Uh, 
folded into one. Uh, so on the on the uh, the juvenile uh, drivers of the juvenile crime, I think there's no one single cause. There's a bunch of things that contribute to it. Um, you know, on the uh, tra traditional violent crime side, you see, for example, situations where you have gangs who uh, will task juveniles to be the shooter because of the perception that they have uh, that the consequences to the juvenile will be less than it would be if the shooter was an adult. So that's an example. But you also have uh, carjackings, which an awful lot of the carjackings are juveniles who, um, for a variety of reasons, have are kind of drawn to that crime as something um, that um, they like to get credit for, uh, strange as it might sound. I mentioned the, the counterterrorism dimension to it. You know, there, uh, there's an awful lot of connectivity between juveniles from across multiple states or even multiple countries where you get kids essentially online, whether it's a gaming platform or some social media platform, essentially egging each other on to commit violence. So that's part of it. Uh, there's probably a long list of other factors that I could go into, but those are some of the things that, that we're seeing. Switching over to the, uh, the hate crime side, um, it is a source of great concern. We have seen an increase uh, in hate crimes over the last few years, uh, specifically on anti-Semitism. Uh, I've been very vocal about this. Even before October 7th, we had seen a significant rise in uh, religiously motivated hate crimes, especially anti-Semitic violence and threats. And since October 7th, the threat level has gone to a whole nother level. Um, and we've seen a, a marked increase in threats and reported uh, tips related to threats, uh, related to uh, violence uh, or attempts at violence uh, directed towards the Jewish community or Israeli interests. Uh, it's not the only kind of violence that we've seen an uptick in since October 7th, but it, you know, the, the Jewish community represents something like 2.4% of the American population, and yet about 60% of religiously motivated violence is directed at Jewish victims. Um, and that should be alarming to everybody. So we are committed to working very closely with all of our law enforcement partners uh, and with the Jewish community, both nationally and locally, uh, to try to help them uh, be better prepared to anticipate uh, threats, to know what to report, when to report it, who to report it to. Uh, it helps inform them so they can provide better physical security for synagogues. Obviously, this is an area it's not that long ago that we had the, uh, the siege, in effect, you know, in, in Colleyville. Um, and uh, so this community knows all too well that uh, the key is partnerships and preparation, uh, and that's what we're committed to.